maybe we should have started out with like listening to Backstreet's back all right and just like getting our energies no, 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 up no no no, 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 no. <laughs> i almost want to do that now. oh god no Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is episode 10 of Tech Tree. I'm joined by just one of my co-hosts today, unfortunately. Hello, Shivan. Yeah, the, you did get the name right, FYI. Uh, <laughs> well, hello to all our listeners. And yes, we are back. It's just the two of us this time around. We were off the air a little more than we'd like, I think, because a couple of personal things came up while we were gone. We just didn't get the bandwidth to put the band back together. I like I like the I like the pun, man. Like bandwidth and band together not bad yeah that was un- unintentional one of our co-hosts partha has been relocating is left to buy uh for now just the logistics of it became a little more difficult than we were used to but yeah we've finally got our act um together again and we are here to talk about drones today yeah and uh, and partha should be joining us on the next episode so you'll just miss him for this episode we do have uh, we do have some astex tech tree stuff that we've got and we've, we've got a couple of follow-up bits so we're going to reserve them for the next episode when Partha's back with us and today we're just going to focus on talking about drones and since we have um you know one of the wise leading drone experts with us on the show fortunately enough yeah well thank you for for saying that i appreciate it so uh so the idea is to kind of talk about uh drones and the way they are and talk about the technology a little bit we want to talk a little bit about um the state of the technology of some of the policy around it so that you guys get a better sense of what's going on um and then perhaps potentially talk also a little bit about the security elements of it some of the concerns um and things you should know if you would like to own a drone especially out here right so uh, shaban let's maybe start with uh, a little bit about the tech itself right part of the thing of course is and i know you feel a little bit strongly about this too is about you know defining what a drone is versus uh, just any automated uh, flying vehicle right well yeah this is like a loaded question and i'll tell you why and it's, it's a testament to how far the industry has come but when we got started using drones a couple of years ago um what would classify as a drone was basically anything that you could sort of fly um hands off so you could you know get the drone off the ground relatively relatively easily and if you took your hands off the stick um of the radio controls it would sort of stay where it was it wouldn't like come crashing out of the sky that was for the smaller more consumer drones uh back then DJI uh, which is the world leading um consumer drone company right now in terms of market share and size they just came out with a drone called the Phantom 1 which is if you want to if you want to look compared to Apple it was the first iPhone of of drones and it sort of changed how everyone looked at consumer drones and before that you needed skills to operate these drones you needed to learn how to fly you needed to know about radio control you needed to know a whole bunch of different things um and it required a certain level of expertise and what this drone did was it just demolished all those barriers for for entry into this uh, into this hobby slash industry and um uh, things have really moved forward since then because now the next it's been what three or four generations since then i think four generations of there's the latest one's the phantom 4 so if you look at it that way drones have come to a point where you can go to a store pick one up and be flying in under i don't know half an hour an hour as long as it takes you to charge the batteries basically and they're hands off they take off by themselves they can do automated missions by themselves you can just point on your ipad where you want it to go and it'll go there you can use your ipad to point the camera where you like or your iphone whatever smartphone you have actually it's not even related to ipads anymore you can use it on android and that was not the case years ago um and this wasn't too long ago it was like 5 years ago where we didn't have smartphones connected with with these drones and you needed either a laptop or a drone's built-in controller so that was the scope of where we are and this is coming to the next point where we're having all of these problems with drones and it's because of that because companies like DJI have decided yeah we're going to put drones in hands of everyone we're going to demolish the price points of of drones we're going to make them super accessible that's led to a lot of growing pains because regulatory authorities are playing catch up with what to do with this explosion of flying devices that anyone can go out and buy uh which are getting smarter and smaller i think it's a complex question and it's a complex problem that requires um a very like detailed selective careful approach to resolve it and we're still somewhere in the middle of all of it right now i think uh, 
uh, regulations worldwide are have relatively sort of been in place for the last like, two, three years now, and they're still being refined. Dubai's got its own regulatory framework, which has been refined and already put in place. And we have a licensing system, we have a registration system, but I think there's still a long way to go. I, one thing uh, you mentioned as well is like, um, you know, we had DJI and the Phantom 1 come in. Do you see differences in how outside of the hobby aspects of course but like do you see differences in how drones are used today because of this versus how they were being used prior to the phantom one and stuff coming into the to the market yeah so i think before the barriers to entry were very very high so i'll give an example the cost of just the flight controller or the brains that runs a drone can, could be anywhere between five to ten thousand dollars and upwards before and you have to sort of build this thing together and drones have been used for a long time, even before DJI came along. Yamaha actually used to make agricultural drones, uh, which were gas-powered drones. And beyond the, the sort of consumer market, there were companies that were making um, drones for mapping and for surveying um, and other applications. But these were, this was considered really sort of exclusive high-end industry, which is one below military drones, basically. And a lot of military manufacturers also had civilian versions of their drones, but none of it was something you could go out and buy as a company. No way. You just, you wouldn't do it because how are you going to get the pilots? How are you going to get the training done? The drones are like upwards of $200,000, $100,000. What happens when there's a mistake? This is not something that could just make it, the technology accessible. And it was complicated. You needed a high level of training. Uh, that's not the case anymore. Um, you don't need much training because now you um, the consumer drones are smaller, safer. They've got you know collision avoidance. They've got automated systems that just keep the drone safe. So they take a lot of the legwork out of operating it. And because the costs are lower and the cost to operate it is lower uh, and the, the ease of operations is there, that suddenly now everyone can sort of, you as a company can go out and, and buy a bunch of drones and, and do all kinds of things that you wouldn't normally ever think of um, five, six years ago. When we're talking about like drones, because we're using the word pretty freely, right? Uh, you know, we are specifically referring to unmanned vehicles, right? Yes. The interesting thing is is what's, what the Chinese are working on. So the Chinese, I think, um, I've been hearing rumors that they're working on big drones. I mean, we're talking drones the size of small airplanes, which are basically airplanes. They're not, they're not helicopter-style drones. They're aircraft-style drones. And they're using them potentially to have completely unmanned cargo fleets that can operate 24-7, uh, can operate with uh, with a lot of um, not just efficiency, but they can be on very very tight schedules because uh, you don't have pilots and crews having to change and all of that stuff. Exactly, you just boom boom boom, all you uh, refuel off you go, refuel off you go, that kind of scenario. And they're planning to bring that mainstream soon. Um, I don't know. I, th- I think it's still being tested. Um, and this is like we're talking. These are rumors that I've heard. So we're, this is not stuff that's been published yet. Uh, anywhere, but I, I have uh, suppliers and, and business interests in, in China, and they were talking about stuff like this happening. Um, so yeah, I think, and they're probably not the only ones. I mean, these are probably programs that countries are running in parallel to test them out, and I'm sure that other countries are working on this as well. And it's not a bad idea, right? In the past, when you're talking about that, I mean, that's what you would use it for, right? You would use it for surveys, agriculture purposes. It's, it's changing a lot. I mean, we look at things like aerial photography, not just because it's like you're surveying something, but aerial photography as a hobby, right? Uh, I mean, we talk about, you know, the stuff, especially like in India, this is like a huge market, like aerial photography of weddings and other events and things like that as well, right? So that, that, that has been part of the shift as well, because you know, now my I can afford a drone, but my need for a drone isn't to survey, I don't know, an agricultural farmland. Yeah, so... Now, aerial photography is, it was a novelty a few years ago where people were like, oh my God, look at this. Uh, it was shot by a drone. Now it's like everywhere. It's like on everyone's Instagram feeds and it's on YouTube. It's on CNN. You know, every single segment that they do, they'll have like these sort of panning drone shots of, oh, we're covering X uh, flood or we're covering this big uh, show slash event slash um, um, concert. And there'll like, just be these sort of uh, wide shots of, of dro- uh, from the air. And that's it, you know, that's, it's just, it's so part and parcel of life that that charm, I think, is, is reducible. At least for me, I guess maybe because I'm, 
I see this stuff every day, so it's, it's like, yeah, whatever. Uh, but back in the day, just I used to operate drones before because you need to have special operators. Just getting a bloody camera in the air and getting it stable, uh, free from vibration, and getting good shots from it and triggering it at the right time, uh, and getting the feed up and running from from the camera down to the ground onto a TV screen um, wirelessly took a lot of work. Um, it, it it did, and now it's just pff, everything's integrated, and it's it's so much simpler. So. Uh, it, but it has led to this explosion of of people that have done some really creative things. It's not to be all cynical, but it's led to this entire new medium of photography, um, which was not accessible before. Interestingly enough, before these these drones came came along, aerial photography was actually done using kites and balloons, but mostly kites. Uh, it was called CAP, K A P, uh, kite aerial photography. Balloons. Uh, not really ideal because you need a big balloon to, to haul any kind of weight so people just use like a little GoPro type thing on it. Um, but then kites you can lift a significant amount of weight uh, and in the right wind conditions and with a big enough kite. So people strap cameras onto kites and fly them and then trigger them remotely using cables attached to little thin cables coming down the kite string. Um, and, and yeah, that was called CAP and there was an entire forum dedicated to it, which I used to visit, which was fascinating. Uh, and it was like, um, the camera would sort of move around with the wind and it would like, you couldn't really get it to point where you wanted to. So eventually people started building these really intricate contraptions to get the camera to point wherever they wanted to or against the wind. So they had some, some control over it. Um, and this was again, but it, yeah, so aerial photography again is not something new it's been around for a while it's just now it's exploded and a lot more people are doing it and back in the day it was just this exclusive thing where very few people had the means and the access and and the knowledge to be able to pull it off that's i mean that's super interesting actually i did not know that uh, kites were used this aggressively uh, for for i mean I've, I've seen them do interesting things with kites by the way like it's not like i didn't know but i didn't know it was this dedicated right like in terms of trying to do all these contraptions and things that's that's fascinating but um so let's talk a little bit about the a little bit about the capabilities as well, right, today. So we've talked about what's happened in the past, where, you know, where is it being used today outside of, obviously, the ones we've talked about. Um, and some what are the, some of the things that drones are doing today that perhaps were impossible five years ago? And you alluded to one or two of them. Okay, so uh, there's a lot that you can use this tech for. I mean, the industries across the world are just finding newer and better uses for it. But my personal, in my personal opinion, I think, what you can do is drones are not just things with cameras on them. You can, I mean, I've been part of these events over here in Dubai where groups from all across the world, whether it's universities or private companies, uh, would come here and display the latest drone tech and there would be um, there would be a competition and, you know, best team wins. And cameras weren't really, they were just being used to see where the drone's going. So all it came down to was what kind of payload uh, what kind of capabilities you had and so from using um, drones that have or carrying payloads that can detect nuclear uh, um, nuclear leaks uh, non nuclear radiation leaks so they had these radiation leak detectors on them so you could fly them let's say in Japan where you had the, the nuclear disaster the, the plant uh, meltdown uh, and you could check for for localized leaks and and build a radiation map of the area. So from that to uh, finding out, um, um, we're using hyperspectral cameras, for example, to see um, sort of beneath things and, and not really beneath things, but hyperspectral is just you're able to see more spectrum, so you can see uh, an image. So let's say you have a hyperspectral camera on on an, a drone flying really high, and you want to see um, if there are um, refugees uh, illegally being transported or there's human trafficking. You could possibly, you know, figure out from the spectrum uh, analysis of, of of images whether there's people on board or whether there's in uh, illegal substances being being transported. And all of this is sort of boiling down to drones being super capable as platforms and then people finding newer and interesting technologies that they can add to that platform to, to you know, so the whole package just goes even further together. And there was a project interesting enough that I was involved in, which uh, I was very passionate about recently, which was the delivery of, uh, of essential medical items um, uh, in, in the South Pacific uh, island nation of Vanuatu. And uh, this is a small 
uh, island nation that's just off the coast of Australia, um, closer to New Zealand probably. And um, they have lots of lots of islands. Uh, they're they're a very very small happy nation. Um, and the problem is because they're an island nation, and and some of these islands are. When I'm saying remote, we're talking remote. They just have like an airstrip. There's no roads. There's no there's no proper uh, electrical uh, grid. Uh, they're just running off the grid. Um, dirt tracks. Uh, most of the villages are on on the coast. Some villages are on the inside. You're surrounded by shrubs and 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 palm trees and jungles. So if you want to go from point A to point B, it's like a six hour, four hour trek just to get from one village to another. And the idea that the government of Vanuatu had was to try and use drones to do medical deliveries because right now UNICEF is involved in in doing deliveries um, in, 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 well, the current old-fashioned way, but hopefully that'll change soon, which is by, by foot. So the UNICEF people will then walk from village to village uh, administering vaccines to kids uh, to root out diseases like, you know, hepatitis and polio. And uh, they're exploring whether drones would be a more efficient method to deliver these vaccines. You mentioned UNICEF, and we're talking about like aid and and humanitarian stuff. Like, what other 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 places where drones have been used for delivering um, help to people? I'm not sure that a lot of this stuff is talked about, and a lot of people know about it because it's not it doesn't make for very exciting news. But drones are actually super useful in any country that has limited infrastructure, which is developing. Uh, here's a weird example. We all know about the Zika virus, um, so this has been a problem in a lot of developing nations where the virus will, will cause birth defects. So people have been using drones, um, agencies actually have been using drones to experiment with dropping sterile mosquitoes uh, in, in areas where Zika is there. So these sterile mosquitoes are frozen on, not frozen, but kept under very cold temperatures on the drones. Drones are then deploying them over, let's say, areas where there's a swamp or where you know that there's a possible breeding location for mosquitoes. And the sterile male mosquitoes will then go in and mate with with the Zika carrying um, a, a population of, of, of uh, um, female mosquitoes and then render that entire area um, sterile. That's exactly the point, right? So th- those, those eggs won't hatch um, when they lay those eggs and the population is essentially rendered um, 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 harmless to, to, to people. And so you can basically combat not just Zika. Zika is an example that I use, but you can essentially look at maybe even malaria, even other mosquito-borne diseases. And you can even scale this up to other insect species that can cause uh, problems in human beings uh, on a large enough scale. So that's that's another example um, that's just, it's completely left field, but drones are perfect for that because you can target areas uh, from the air and you can do it at a fraction of the cost. You don't have to walk and trek, uh, trek over mountains and swamps and, and jungles. You just go out and you fly above and you deploy. If you want to talk about medical deliveries, it would be unfair to talk about uh, the subject and not mention a company called Zipline. They've been doing blood deliveries um, for the blood and um, I think vaccines as well. But they've been doing this for the last two years and they've been doing it for, they're a company based out of the US and San Francisco and they were very smart. They decided that, all right, instead of fighting regulations in the US, we're gonna set up regulation, uh, set up our operations in, in a country which has limited regulation and get the government support. So the Rwandan, the Rwandan government then said, all right, why don't you guys, you know, they, they helped them out, they're working with the government and they've got a very successful blood delivery program that they're now looking at scaling up in other parts of the world. And they've sort of, if you look at it, they've beaten Google and Amazon. And this is a small company, which is doesn't have that, that kind of funding, but they've done really, really well. So uh, another positive example there, if you look at uh, disaster and um, uh, like earthquake hit areas, uh, there's an organization called the Humanitarian UAV Network, um, and that's sort of uh, Patrick Mayer is is one of the people behind that, and uh, he then founded a company called We Robotics that have been heavily involved in in specifically using drones and emerging technologies to help people in 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 developing nations. So what they do is instead of saying, "All right, we'll have a crack team of." of people flying around the world, which is impractical, is they set up and they empower people in those nations. So they will set up flying labs, for example, in Tanzania. Um, they have a flying lab there. 
and they'll go out and their people will then train those people and and think of it as just setting up pilot programs across the world uh peru was i think another location that they've gone to um and they've done they're doing deliveries they're training people to use drone data uh, and, uh, and how that applies to them uh they're doing a lot of work so it's just it, it's a matter of implementation i think um with with drone tech and and um humanitarian and aid groups because uh as long as you're, you've got the will and the funding, a lot can be done. Yeah, and I think uh, we just, uh, when when it comes to aid and stuff, I think people, we just have a very traditional approach to this stuff, right? Where it's like, let's send a bunch of people there and they'll, they'll go and do, uh, qualified people, no doubt, but like they'll go and do something. And sometimes we just, because we've just set the budgets that way and that's how we think about funding and everything else, then all of this stuff seems like an added cost, right? Like, oh, I also have to then go and do this. But I think if we... If we're better about it, and we will get better about it, with these examples that you're mentioning as well, um, where you start to realize, like, instead of sending 10 people there and potentially also increasing a bit of risk of exposure, uh, perhaps let's, you know, let's get some drones into play so that they can do a better job, they can scale better, they're more efficient when it comes to this stuff, and you're reducing the human risk. And it can be called as and when necessary, as opposed to a schedule. So you can do scheduled deliveries and unscheduled deliveries. We, when we think of drone deliveries, we always consider that, oh, yeah, I want my pizza delivered by drone. I want my burger delivered by drone. I want my souk.com package delivered by drone. Yes, that's super useful. But if you had a big drone, that could be a lot more efficient than the current logistics of, of having aircraft fly in into passenger terminals. You can have drone terminals uh, in, in, in cities in, in, in addition to passenger terminals and, and use those drone airports to, to transfer goods, just like, you know, uh, cargo trains run. I think that I think the drone delivery landscape is something that's super interesting because even even uh, when we talk about the, I want my you know uh, like a souk or Amazon package delivered or or whatever it is, right? The fact that drone deliveries can be talked about in that in that sense, like we're talking about some mainstream application, like Repelf, you know, a world where like your stuff is delivered to you, um, you know, without human intervention but also without then the the perils of traffic and all of this other stuff that comes into play and making sure things come come to you in you know the sometimes unrealistic time frames that people expect things to show up at their doorstep but you can deliver that right with a drone but the fact that you can do that implies that there is a huge change coming to the drone landscape uh, the the delivery landscape you know with without any doubt whatsoever and even though there is of course there's a lot of things to think about because this is in not only is this a new area, i.e. city airspace or just airspace, is not an area where that has been democratized, right? Like it's always been a very controlled thing. Um, so that there's obviously like a lot of complications that have come because of that, which is why it's going to take some time. It's not that the technology doesn't exist to deliver a pizza to your door, but it's also like figuring out the logistics behind it. It is figuring out the logistics. And that's the key word here, because what a lot of people don't understand is if if I want your uh, your where in in greens, you can drop me a GPS location to your house, and if I have a drone with uh, enough range, I could fly one down to you right now, and, and send you a pencil or or you know something that's the 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 drone can comfortably carry that distance. Because the more weight you add, the the longer the harder the drone has to work to keep that weight in the air, and the shorter its flight time. But let's say currently, like most of these drones can make that trip. The problem is not that. The problem is the minute you fly something and you get it off the ground, you are intruding in the country's airspace. And this is a concept that very few people understand. And just because you buy an object and it's it's readily available in, 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 in a store does not necessarily mean it has, you know, that all the framework to get it in the air is, 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 is being worked out. Right now, it's not being worked out. Right now, if you get a drone off the ground, uh, you have to file paperwork with the authorities to let them know that, hey, there's going to be a drone flying. Because if I were to fly to your house, if the drone's path crosses with a helicopter, which is carrying people on, on their way somewhere, you know, what if it's an emergency evac helicopter? Uh, most of these evac helicopters fly without submitting flight plans sometimes because it's, it's not an emergency, right? So they all just do it right then and there and off they go. So you don't want to you don't want to cause any kind of, I mean, there's no scenario where a drone should ever impact someone's life or someone uh, or, or an aircraft in the air. No pilot should ever have to worry about shit like this, you know? So there's therein lies the problem of what we call segregation of airspace because we need to hi, um, basically say, all right, 
there's a certain zone that drones are going to be operating in and aircraft have to stay away from that. And that becomes complicated when you have an airport in the middle of the city or when you have like lots of air traffic, which in this part of the world, especially in the UAE, that is the case. We are one of the busiest air, air spaces in the world. You don't want anything impacting that. And hence the, the time frame to getting, you know, these sort of point to point deliveries, which we think are easy, are not really that easy. The tech is there. The regulations have to catch up. But also, let's say I do drop something to your house. Um, there's also the problem of last mile. Like, how do you know the drone's coming? Where do you know where to stand? Um, it can't leave it on the on on on, um, on the road in front of your house because what if somebody else picks it up, the package? The drone shouldn't land because what if a dog runs at it or a kid runs at it? So ideally, it should run, stay in the air. And if you look at uh, Amazon and Google and, and some of these other companies that are doing deliveries, some of them choose not to land their drones. So... Google's entire project, uh, it was called Project Wing, and their their entire thing was that, all right, we're not going to land the drone because it's too risky, and it's also very energy, it, it wastes a lot of energy uh, taking off again. So uh, we're going to stay, keep the drone in the air, and we're going to drop the package using a string. Um, and Amazon's model was different. No, we're going to land in front of your, in your front yard, and we're... Um, we're gonna take off again and you can take the package from the drone. So everyone's got this sort of different approach to it. I think the right approach will probably be something that'll be have to be tried in the real world um, and then verified. And that's what all of these guys are doing. They're conducting private trials right now. Yeah, but even that is not is not is not straightforward, right? I mean, different cities are built differently. Different within a, I mean, look at just look at Dubai, right? How you would deliver a drone in in a certain area would be very different from how you would deliver it in a different one, which is all high rise and let's say on Sheikh Zayed Road, uh, completely different model. Because now you just have windows, you don't even have balconies, and so where do you land it? Assuming you want to hit a certain floor and stuff like that, like you'll have to figure out a, a landing space, you know, that kind of thing. Actually, you know, I have an idea for Dubai. Um, and not just Dubai, for any any met, any sort of ultra-populated metro city with high-rise towers and villas and stuff like that, you just land them on the roofs. That's what I would do. I would land on the roof, and, and, and you know how we have P.O. boxes everywhere? Uh, in, 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 like, so you go to New York, your P.O. box is in your building, sort of. So your mail comes there. You could have a similar system based out of a roof um, where you can go to the roof, and, and yes, it requires a bit of infrastructure work on the part of every building owner and maybe the drone companies can sort of pitch in or whatever. Somehow, let's say we work all the kinks out uh, and we get to the gravy and the gravy is this, that you have infrastructure on your roof. That's like a, a roof PO box system. The drones land there. Your package gets automatically offloaded, gets sorted based on your barcode and your address, goes automatically to your locker and it stays there for you. And then if you want, someone can go up and retrieve it for you and deliver it to your doorstep, or you can go and get it yourself. Um, it's just a short elevator ride away. And and I think that sort of resolves some of the last mile problems that one would have in place like, uh, that's super populated. And also means that drones can just fly onto the roofs uh, and, and they don't have to fly really high. They can just relatively be at a uh, skyscraper level and not interfere in, 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 in you know, traffic because most of the time helicopters are not allowed to fly below uh, building level their 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 minimum altitude is supposed to be well above the higher high rise towers so yeah but yeah again it really is one of those things where you have to tailor the solution to the problem and and it requires a different solution for almost every demographic and every city and every part of the world and, and where they are yeah exactly yeah that's what i was getting at i think like it's it is not as simple as we'd like it to be which is why especially because i mean when you want to when you want a company to deliver something like it has to be efficient as well we can't have a custom solution per building right like that that cannot that cannot scale it has to be a little bit more standardized even at least by an area we say okay Sheikh Zayed Road, this is how we'll deliver versus somewhere else it can't be you know, for these two buildings on Sheikh Zayed Road, it'll deliver here on this roof uh, with yeah. this system. But uh, exactly. on these two buildings, it'll be delivered in this way. And like that, just the, the amount of customization that would have to happen would be crazy. No, it has to be something that's sort of one size fit all. So if you have a tower or a building, it, it's this solution. It has to work for all of them in the same way and give them the same level of service. If you have villas, same thing. Um, whatever the, the right solution may be. I mean, for me, I, I automatically go to roofs because I'm looking from a drone's perspective, which is it's super convenient to do that. Maybe it's not super convenient. And that's where you bring in a whole bunch of people who'll 
throw a whole bunch of problems at you and be like, all right, what about this? What about this? What about this? Yeah, which is which is going to be one of my questions. Which is you know, let's talk about the security aspect of this as well because, um, you know, once you once you have this, once you have this infrastructure sitting on the roof, like how easy is it going to be then for someone, a random person, to then fly one of his drones into this thing that's set up that fits his drone? Oh, it's that's not possible. So the, the whole thing again, unless you have unless that, all right. Uh, since I've clearly thought this out, uh, let me tell you why that wouldn't be possible. So that would be easy to, to resolve. So let's say someone does fly the drone there. What are they going to do to land? Okay, that's the max they can do. Because if if you're part of our, let's say, our charter drone delivery service, uh, our fictional charter drone delivery service, where you contract the drone, our drones are going to have, um, let's say, RFID, which is encrypted, or some sort of near-field communications, um, or something that basically... The, the, the payload is only dropped off if it's one of our drones and you'd have to break that encryption and we can you're an IT guy you know that encryption we can be you can have a lot of fun with that uh, make sure that it's only authorized drones that are allowed to land um, we can also have doors that only open up for the right drones so you just like you've seen I don't know in missile silos where you have these drawers that open up and the missile shoots out um, something like that that could only open up for the right authorized drones and the drones go in and then land over there and, and unauthorized drones are just, the door's just not gonna open, so what are you gonna do? I mean, there's nothing you can do. And let's say someone does decide to land, you can always have like capturing devices or alarms or something that takes a picture or something that, that can can disable the drone's localized uh, RF gun, which will, sh- uh, will fire and take the drone out. So if someone does decide to mess with it, it'll, it'll just be a losing proposition for them yeah i think i i mean so of course i understand that right like i do know that uh, perhaps maybe we can touch on it a little bit more in detail because we're kind of talking uh, at the high level but yeah there are a lot of anti-drone technologies that are available already and the, and some of these are like like you said with rfid and so these are very very old technologies like they didn't start with the with the advent of drones right they've been around for a long time uh, i think my question is more you know every every aspect of this and i think this goes back to the original um, statement that we made, which is, um, you know, the logistics are, are still the issue, right? Which is to be able to do this, which it's not just as simple as saying, okay, well, you're right, all right, well, let's install this, um, you know, this sort of system uh, with the set of PO boxes or lockers at the top of every building, that's all it is. It's not just that, right? And you also have to look at sort of managing the other side of it, the safety, aspect of it i mean the drone has to land correctly and all this stuff and all of this stuff has to work out great because you know you know how it is right do you start putting private contractors in place to start deploying the stuff and someone's gonna you know uh, short chain somebody somewhere and then it's going to become like this thing we're like well you know it's not, it, what's the big deal who's going to fly a drone somebody you know so all of this has to be like really standardized right it has to be really really done well because you can't have a situation where uh, someone's safety could be impacted right because the silly, you know, the, the the thing drops it in the wrong place or something like that. Uh, someone's security could be compromised. Again, same story. You have to make sure that this whole stuff is tried and tested well. Um, and then, of course, the interference from other drones and other systems as well. So I think all of this stuff has to be pieced together and really standardized before, uh, you know, we can do what we're talking about, which is our drone charter service, which is this automated thing that, that can just exist on our rooftops and, and it all works out you know, swimmingly. Yeah, I mean, again, bear in mind, we're talking in the realms of fiction right now. I mean, the tech is there, but our scenarios are completely fictional. And yes, there's people are going to be saying, oh, but what about this and what about that? But guess what? When you have packages being sent by bikes, do you see anyone messing with that? Do you see? No. So after a point, people become desensitized to these things. And they're like, yeah, I'm not going to do this because I really don't have the time for this. And, and nobody messes with, with deliveries currently you will expect the same indifference to messing with drone deliveries because the cost of messing with that is expensive. Your drone is not going to be something that is 100 dirhams. You're talking a minimum five, 6,000 dirhams just to mess with something. Who would do that? Yeah, maybe one person who's really got a a, a beef with, with or has some problem. But honestly, I don't really see that being that much of an issue because again, it's, it's one of those things that when it becomes routine, people turn their attention to other things. And that's that's how I look at it. So let's talk also about, um, you know, those that want to get started out, um, I, I guess, particularly in this region, but I guess in general as well. Uh, maybe, you know, what would be your recommendation for perhaps like a starter kit and maybe a slightly more advanced? Again, coming back to DJI, they are the world's largest manufacturer for a reason. They have the largest uh, market share. 
they do make some of the best consumer drones known to mankind. And if you're looking at top drones, you 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 have to look at DJI and um, a couple of the ones I would recommend. So my recommendation is if you're starting out right now, you've never done you know flown a drone before, get something small, maneuverable, so that the smaller it is, it won't break that easily because big and heavy objects when they fall out of the sky tend to shatter. Smaller drones because they're lightweight, um, made out of um, um, you know, hardware and plastic tend to take knocks a little bit better. So look at, let's say, the DJI Spark. That's the smallest drone that they make, and there's two versions of it. One you can fly, uh, you can just buy the drone and not buy the controller, and you use your iPhone or your smartphone to, to, to fly it. I wouldn't recommend that, actually. I'd say get the controller because, honestly, the, the fine control that you get using your thumbs and, and just like regular RC gear is way better than using a smartphone. So a Spark is a good bet. Then there's the DJI um, Mavic Air, which is a slightly larger version, um, or actually a smaller version of the Mavic, which we'll come to as well. So that's another uh, small drone that you can get. Most of these things can fly for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, um, up to half an hour, depending on winds and how you fly it. If you have small kits, definitely stick with the small drones because, again, it becomes a safety issue. Um, but let's say you want to fly you know, and do aerial photography. So the cameras on the Spark, I wouldn't say it's amazing. It's, it's really good for its size. It's actually probably the best you can get for its size. But let's say you're looking for you know, uh, something a bit of a step up, go with the Phantom 4 Pros or, or the Phantom Pros, whichever the latest version is. So look at the Phantom series basically with the, the professional versions and they have 20 megapixel cameras. They have one inch sensors. So these are like almost, um, they can get you some pretty insane image quality for, for something that small. And another recommendation is a lot of people will just get the drone and the controller and they forget that when you fly out 25 minutes up into the desert, you need more batteries because uh, just getting the one standard or two standard batteries is probably not enough if you're out for a day or half a day or whatever on a road trip. Uh, so get one of those. Uh, DJI does fly more bundles. So have a look at those. They're pretty reasonable. They come with their own carrying cases. Just to summarize the DJI side of recommendations, you can look at the Spark, the Mavic Air, the DJI Mavic, which is a slightly older generation, which, by the way, FYI, is probably going to be replaced with the Mavic 2, whose launches, I think, they're going to launch the Mavic 2 very, very soon. Um, so don't don't get that one right now as, as of the airing of this episode. I'll wait for the Mavic 2. Unless you're getting a good bundle deal, then maybe, why not? And then the Phantom series is a step up. Uh, apart from that, there's also another manufacturer, uh, one or two manufacturers you can look at. There's um, Parrot, uh, which generally makes smaller consumer drones, and they also have an enterprise division, which is very, very big in the mapping front. But they also make um, the Anafi, which they've launched recently, which is competing with the Mavics and the Sparks of DJI. So it's a small drone, good image quality. Uh, it's something to look at, see the reviews, see how it plays out. And uh, apart from the Parrot and Nafi, there's also Unique. So Unique have small drones that you can look at. There's got one, I think they've got one called the Breeze, uh, which is, it's a bit old now, so you may not actually find it for a big discount. But these are these small, tiny drones that are relatively easy to store, easy to, to transport, and easy to, to, um, to fly around um, in restricted spaces, and just you won't really hurt anyone with them. If you're looking at this professionally, then of course, that's a completely different conversation because it requires a completely different approach. But um, for, for consumer stuff, uh, it's by the way, when, I, when most people give recommendations, they just talk about all of these um, helicopter style, multi-rotor drones. There's also um, aircraft style drones. So these drones that have wings um, and they can fly for a lot longer. So if you're looking at something like that, I think Parrot also make the Parrot Disco for about five, five and a half thousand dirhams. And the Disco is a flying wing drone. And you can, you get goggles, you can get, um, uh, we call it FPV. So you get these goggles that give you a live feed from the drone's camera. And it sort of gives you this sort of in-flight view um, and you get to fly without really flying. And that's another fun thing to try out if you're looking to get drones is to instead of just doing it what everyone else is doing and getting multi-rotors is to try and get uh, a winged drone. Apart from the disco, there's a couple others you can put together yourself as well. So if you're a bit of a DIY kind of person, um, there's lots of tutorials uh, online, which I won't get into again right now because it's, it's another topic altogether. But you can 
basically build your own drone and that's quite a fun learning experience um, apart from um, from being it gives you a sense of pride when you fly one of these things that you built from your from your own you know with your own two hands so yeah those are the options again to summarize you get the -the off-the-shelf stuff from DJI you can look into Parrot and their offerings or you can look into maybe building something yourself so let's let's uh, talk a little bit about the the security aspect of all this as well. We, we touched on it, and I know, but I think if we're addressing, especially for those that like want to get into drones, right? We've kind of touched on a few things with regards to hey, be careful. You know, the moment you fly your drone, you're you're walking into somebody's airspace, um, uh, and you know, there's a lot of anti-drone tech out there already, but we're still seeing, and we're, you know, we we still see issues where people are still getting away with stuff, and as you mentioned, the policies are still catching up. Um, so. For someone that wants to get into drones and stuff, um, where does he, I guess where he begins is something we've talked about, right? Because today you can find drones pretty much off the shelf. But also, uh, what are some of the things you should keep in mind uh, in terms of not messing with or impacting um, both the, the policy of the city and stuff like that, but also just security in general of the people that he might be photographing or something? So I think... That's one of those questions where you should look at what RC flyers have been doing for the last X number of years. You know, people have been flying remote control helicopters and, uh, and aircraft and, and all of these things. And there's a realization among RC guys, and that is that when you make a mistake with one of these aircraft or helicopters, or like let's say you fly an airplane, RC airplane, into a crowd of spectators that, at an event. So they, we have these RC events. There are rules around that. And... There's a sense of responsibility with RC guys, which is just not there with consumer drone guys. So you have, I mean, I see these YouTube videos of people flying drones in, in packed crowd spaces, and they're just being, I'm sorry, but they're being idiots. Uh, because they think that just because a drone's got a gyroscope and it's got localized, you know, uh, dual GPS systems on there, and it's got collision avoidance that somehow it negates them from responsibility. It doesn't. If you've screwed up, then you understand the consequences. And that's the issue I also have with Chinese companies putting uh, drones in the hands of every single person. You know, they have this, it's irresponsible. Either you have tech in your drones that stops people from doing stupid things, which currently, not really, it's not there. I mean, we have a few things. We have no-fly zones and a couple other things that you can't take off near an airport. You can't do some things. But it's not, it's not foolproof. It's not bulletproof. So the companies are just like, yeah, let's make the most money we can by putting as many drones as we can out there into the hands of as many people and make it seem like it's perfectly okay for you to fly a drone around uh, um, a bunch of um, strangers. Uh, And there's recently, there was a case of this idiot who flew a drone into a little baby and the baby had been injured and the guy was arrested. That is a problem I'm talking about. So the sense of responsibility, Chirag, I don't think that's going to happen. People are not responsible. When you start giving access to people uh, to, to, to sort of uh, far-reaching me, a mainstream technology that has a lot of impact to everyone, chances are people are going to do stupid things with it. So I personally, I'm an advocate, advocate for control. The onus is on the manufacturers. If I, as a manufacturer, am making something, I'm going to make sure that people don't misuse it. And I have to figure out uh, the responsible, ideally, in an ideal world, is they should be like, all right, if people are going to misuse this, we're not going to make it. But guess what? That doesn't really happen. And Right now, uh, my advice to people who are starting out is to just understand the responsibilities. Uh, If you are uh, getting something that's got four spinning blades and that has enough momentum to hurt someone and cut someone and cause them to bleed, uh, just be responsible. Know that this is not like there are so many cases where people will like text me like, oh, you know, we got a first drone and and uh, we flew it and it crashed. Yeah. okay. then I asked them, like, did you read the manual? No. Did you at least watch a YouTube video on, you know, the five steps to getting started? No. What do you think was going to happen? I mean, it crashed. Good for you. It, the drone, you know what? I think, guys, uh, there should be a secret um, s- system in drones that they should just crash themselves in the nearest wall if, if you don't read the manual. Yeah. Just so that it teaches you a lesson that yeah, you, just because you've dropped a whole bunch of money on this, that it's, it's not okay. It is not okay. And why do I know this? Because I've seen people get injured. I've seen people get hurt. I've seen accidents. I know what it costs. The batteries on drones, a lot of people think they're quite explosive, actually. Lithium polymer batteries have caught fire when they're being charged. The people's homes have burnt down. 
Uh, this is not a joke. And unfortunately, I guess when you're a consumer and you don't really care about the industry, you don't care about the tech, for you it is a joke. It is for lulls. It is for laughs. It is for the YouTube clicks, uh, the more crazy things you do. There are these Russians are running around on rooftops on in, in the skyscrapers here doing these videos where they're doing handstands on, on top of towers, right? Right on the edge. And they're filming themselves with drones. I mean, it's the dumbest thing that, that you can think of because what happens is when air hits a tower, it causes a lot of turbulence on the far side of the tower. Now, you don't know this, but the minute your drone enters that kind of turbulence, it's going to have, uh, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to get that thing back under control. And, and it's just, it's, it's, it's irresponsible. Um, so my, my, I guess, end of rant, my, my takeaway for, for people that are getting started is to just understand the responsibilities involved, to read and learn about their devices before they take them in the air, and then to understand the rules. Um, every country has different rules. The UAE is very, very, very strict. You're technically not allowed to operate a camera drone uh, without getting it registered. Actually, any drone without getting it registered. But in, in Dubai, you can operate a camera drone legally. In Abu Dhabi and the rest of the UAE, you cannot. It's only within Dubai uh, that they ha- Dubai has a licensing system. So does uh, the rest of the Emirates, but their system is a bit different. So they say, without a camera, we can license your drone. You can fly it. We'll give you a license. But as per the letter of the law, and they can, you're welcome to go to the General Civil Aviation Authority, the GCAA.ae website, download their drone rules uh, guideline, and it says over there, camera drones not allowed. Without camera, you can register it, they'll give you a license for it as, as a hobbyist, and they'll re- put you in their system. And that basically locks you down um, as the owner of that drone. So if something happens, they can track you down and, and find out where you are. So you submit your Emirates ID and all of that, uh, ID documents uh, is related. Now, Dubai, you can uh, get a hobby license. You can get training from either, there's two um, companies that do this. The one is called Sanat, um, and the other one's called Exponent. Um, and they give you, I think there's a third one called Aeromotus. I'm not sure if they do that still. But yeah, you can get training and get uh, a, a drone hobby license. And then you have to know where to fly. Because just because you have a license does not mean you can fly anywhere. So if you're, let's say, near Mirdaf, where near, you're near Dubai airport, you shouldn't be able to fly there because there should be a, there's a no-fly zone there set up um, by the authorities within a certain nautical mile radius around the airport and for other airfields and sensitive areas of the city. So there's an official map that you can download from the Dubai Civil Aviation website that gives you areas which are okay to fly and then there's areas marked in red which you technically should not even be taking off in. Uh, and those are military bases and, and places around palaces and, you know, places like the Burj Khalifa, I don't know, uh, and basically sensitive areas. So, yeah, so once you've got the regulations and, and the knowledge down, then by all means, go out. I think the best place to take a drone these days is just go out in the desert uh, somewhere where, you know, it's, a, it's legal to fly there and there's no hidden military base nearby or anything sensitive. And, and, and just, just practice there and, and go crazy in the mountains where you can't really hurt anyone. And... Um, yeah, and stay away from public places and parks. That's that's all of it in a nutshell. So I think one of the things, I mean, uh, you know, during our conversation, and it's, you were relating to some of this as well. I, I think it, what's interesting to me is that obviously the 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 uh, what's the word I want the the cost of procuring a drone versus buying a vehicle is very different, right? And that's one of the reasons why it's such a big thing. But if you look at how people have driven for years and years and years, right? You can't drive without a license, officially anyway. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? And this is, it's two-dimensional, well, it's not two-dimensional, but you know what I mean. It's three-dimensional driving, and even for that, you need, because it's just going back, forth, left, right, right? Um, and even that requires a license. It requires a minimum age, it has a license, training, uh, uh, you know, a whole fine system and a black point system and all of this other stuff around it because putting people in control of a vehicle that not only can cause harm to yourself, but then also cause harm to somebody else, is something that needs to be regulated. Yeah. And so, and so when, I mean, to sort of map that sort of example over to the side, to be like, okay, obviously it's not entirely the same thing, but there's a fourth dimension. Now you're also taking off and landing in addition to just driving um, or, or controlling the drone. So yeah, while a small drone or a very, very tiny hobby drone is not the same thing as a car, and I understand that difference. So, you know, don't start, hitting me for this example but but the idea that 
the fact that when you're driving something, the fact that when you're controlling something, whether it's a, um, whether it's in the air, whether it's a pilot, whether it's a, any kind of pilot, whether it's on on land in terms of a car, like you you are always given a license, a permit, a sequence of uh, trainings to satisfy both the authorities and yourself that you know you know what you're doing. Yeah, you're, accountability. Yeah, accountability. Yeah, accountability, and you understand what's involved. It's so important that this stuff is properly regulated. We keep seeing these. Um, and I want to talk to you about this also a little bit because I think it's something that a lot of news you see it and you kind of maybe uh, maybe people don't understand necessarily why this is a problem. But we keep seeing these. We haven't seen some recently, and I know it has a lot of it has to do with these countermeasures that have been deployed. But we remember a couple of years ago that we had these airport shutdowns because a drone flew into the airport airspace. Like if, to me, it's it's downright bizarre to begin with because I'm like, dude, I mean, you, you know, you picked up a drone. Like, why are you flying it in the airport? Like, how did you think that that was going to go well? Like, anyway, that logically, but but as you said, you know, like, people don't necessarily think of everything. People will do stupid things, and so that's why it need, the stuff needs to be regulated. Um, so, I mean, it is it has been nice that we haven't seen any, um, we haven't heard of any shutdowns, I think, recently, right? I don't think in the last well, year. Well, the airport has been shut down three times. You mean in totality, yeah, because in of this. In totality. Okay. Um, at one point, it even affected Sharjah airspace. So this is the reason why we're talking about this regulation and control and making sure that you responsibly attend to this stuff. So even though it might be super easy to get a permit if you're not flying a drone with a camera, it doesn't mean that you just start flying randomly, you know, as and when you please. I mean, I've seen people, uh, like you mentioned, you know, do it in like home communities and stuff. Like you, you kind of hear this buzzing and you're kind of wondering what's going on. Suddenly you realize, hey, someone's flying a drone all over my garden or your garden or whatever garden I'm in. It's... I mean, there, there is a there is something to be said about that, right? Like, I mean, I understand the draw of it, and I understand that it's exciting and all of this stuff. But it it does it is an area that people should be extremely there needs to be some responsibility and, as you said, accountability about it. So that's the reason we're talking about that. Uh, but coming back to the example of the airport shutting down, and, and Dubai Airport you mentioned like three times, but I, Dubai Airport's not the only one that was hit by this, right? I mean, we've seen this happen in other countries as well around the world. First of all. The biggest incident that happened was some genius in the White House decided to fly a drone. Um, he was drunk and he was trying to operate a drone, which crashed in the White House, and that caused some massive security ripples. And and this was not the first incident. Some idiot decided to fly a drone to the Japanese Parliament earlier a couple of years ago. Yeah, these massive, big profile, high profile, attention-grabbing headlines uh, done by people who just use these things as tools and as a means to an end. And it caused governments to just, just be like, all right, they, they, they went to the Chinese and just said, all right, you know what? Either you fix this shit or we're going to ban drones just day in and day out. You know, forget it. You're not going to sell a single one of these things on our shores. And I think that was not a bad thing to do because um, I would be pissed if I were in their shoes, right? I mean, you can't make these things that easy to, to get. And so manufacturers that within the first month or ex first few weeks decided uh, I, when I say manufacturers I'm talking about DJI here because you know what as much as I love the company and what they do and their products are excellent n there's no doubt about it their products are really good they push the bar but they've made it too accessible too easy and there's an issue there that I think they, they, they should start bloody addressing so they put in what we call NFZs no fly zones they asked the governments for feedback and they said Give us all your sensitive areas. We'll we'll put it into a firmware, push it out to all the, our consumer drones and all the new ones coming in as well from the future, where the drones simply won't take off in these certain areas, so they can't fly there. Even if you take off in a different area and you try and fly fly there, the drone will hit an invisible bubble and it will stop at the border of what it perceives to be a security restricted area. So they put that in there. So that will was there, but my point was that why was no one else thinking? Why do we have to wait for massive massive security problems like this to occur that's the issue it's always reactionary it is there is no proactiveness there the manufacturers just care about their bottom lines and and they just keep reacting to these things and that's not cool there are people that are trying to do good things with these with this tech and it makes their lives a lot harder and the problem is the good you can do with drones is phenomenal and most people don't talk about it most people don't see it most people don't even realize what's what's possible i guess the reason i get so irritated is, is when i see that being hampered by some moron on youtube it really gets under my skin because it's just it's it's a waste because because all the good guys don't have to work that much harder and they're dubbed and and put in the same group of people as these idiots because once the regulations come in everyone has to has to to follow them and guess what 
after these regs happen, getting them changed or getting them, you go to someone and you're like, hey, you know, we're trying to do this and it's, it's a really good initiative and we want to, let's say, help people in need and in, in, in disaster hit areas. They'll be like, no, we the current regulation of our country is X. You have to follow X. This is the paperwork because the guy you're going to be dealing with is just going to be following the, as bureaucracies go, is going to be following what he knows. And he's like, this is a procedure, da, 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 you can't do this. So it becomes impractical then to get anything done. And there's there's problems like that that have currently affected aid agencies that are using drones in developing countries. So I'm not just saying something that's off the top of my head, no. And I would I kind of do wish that governments and, and um, um, agencies, uh, regulatory authorities worldwide, realize that and, and start differentiating and, and start putting different rules for, for consumers and different rules for other people. But that will take time. Yeah, I think it's also perhaps one of those issues with, uh, you know, a piece of technology or sometimes it's the whole, maybe we talk about larger things as well, uh, that's very democratized, right? Like, so when, um, I mean, this is a whole different conversation to have about like even, you know, social media and those kind of things, right? Where it becomes so hard to regulate because every, there, there are like four um, you know, different parts to the puzzle. So you have, your, in the case of drones, for example, you're, you've got government, their authorities, I mean, their regulations, you've got um, drone manufacturers and all the stuff they're trying to do. And then you've got, say, private companies that, you know, sit on top of it or are trying to do something for themselves. And then you've got all this other, like you call the good stuff or the people that are uh, doing it almost as a humanitarian thing, right? And everybody has to kind of work together to come up with a way to make sure that you read out um, the problem, uh, quote unquote, right? The, the, the issue. So not only does a, does a manufacturer have to then come up and be like, okay, well, we're going to do this because we believe it's the right thing to do, which is already hard a, a hard problem. Yeah, that's not, there's no meeting room in, in, in the world where you can get up and be like, oh, this is the hard thing to do. We're going to do this. People will just be like, yeah, you're fired. Yeah, and it's going to cost us more. Yeah, and it'll hurt your bottom line, but we're going to do it anyway. I sometimes give manufacturers a really hard time. I get, I guess I do come off as giving them a hard time, and I understand that because I guess there's misguided idealism there, maybe whatever. But um, to be fair to them, uh, a company like DJI, for example, who are usually in the middle of almost every controversy anyway, um, are have done amazing things. So because they've made this tech cheaper and accessible is because humanitarian agencies that are currently always underfunded are able to use this tech. You have to do you do have to give them credit for what they've been able to do because the alternative for some of these agencies is to go out and buy other solutions which cost sometimes five to six times more and are you will blow through their annual budget just like that. And if something goes wrong, there goes your year. So it's, it's, um, it is a, it's a dual-edged sword, um, and it is a balancing act, and it's a complex problem. But in the long term, for the industry to, to I think, prosper more people up in, who are in the decision-making pro- process up, up in the food chain, uh, to just be a bit more responsible and proactive. It's just that proactiveness that they need to do. So I was saying, it's, it's also part of the other pieces of the puzzle as well, right? Like, so if a company turns out and says, okay, we're going to do the right thing, obviously it's going to mean that their drones are going to come out slightly more expensive in the next run, right? Because they've done something that that requires them to up their costs for whatever reason. And it takes all it takes is for one private company that is deciding to buy this to go to somebody else that doesn't have that because it's cheaper, Right, and so they, that's why everybody has to kind of play together and be like, no, well, we're going to go with company A because they actually have put in this stuff to make sure, and that's who we are going to stock in our shelves, right? Like it's it's this whole process, and that's why the regulation and stuff is also so important, because even that stuff has to be thought to thought through properly. You can't dump a bunch of regulations that price out these manufacturers from doing good work as well, like you pointed out, right? Like you you can't have all of these regulations that come in and suddenly the cost of every drone is now 2x and therefore, you know, half the business is gone. Or, or And worse is going to be like the people that actually need it, like the humanitarian aids or the NGOs or whatever these other companies are that are trying to do good work, they're the ones that are badly funded. And they're the ones that the moment the drone price of the drone goes, forget 2x, if they go 1 you know, 1.2x or 1.5x, they're not going to be able to do the same work they did the year before. But the hobbyists are happy they're buying one drone or they're buying a small number or actually they're the ones that are not really um, having problems with funding will be like, okay, 2x or 2x, I want to fly my drone over over this park anyway. And so it's very important to find and strike the right balance across like four different types of entities, which is why this is such a complex problem. 
I think that's it from us for this week. Uh, once again, we're sorry for the long gap, but you know we're back and we're going to try and get back to our regular schedule. Uh, Partha should be joining us on our next episode as well. So until then, uh, Shivan, if you'd like to share where people can reach you. So you can, if you have any questions related to drones or pretty much anything that we've discussed in any of our episodes, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Uh, I am at Airspective, so that's um, A-I-R-S-P-E-C-T-I-V. And I'd be happy to hear from you as always. Perfect. Uh, Bartha can be found at uh, at Bartha NS on Twitter and at BarthaNS.com as well. And you can find me on Twitter at ChiragND. That's C-H-I-R-A-G-N-D. Tech Tree is available on Twitter as well. Just look for T3C-H-T-R-E-E. And you can find this episode's show notes and all of our other episodes by visiting techtree.show slash 10. So until next time, it's goodbye. Goodbye.